Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome again to today's live webinar on sparkling wines. I am, my name is Julie Papura Hasbach, and I work for the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. We are very happy to have you all with us today. I am the Education and Member Services Manager at the New York Wine and Grape Foundation. I'm also a certified sommelier through the Court of Master Sommeliers, a certified specialist of wine through the Society of Wine Educators, and WSET3, which is through the Wine Spirit Education Trust Certification, which basically means I'm just a big wine nerd and love discussing and appreciating wine. So thank you for joining me today. Before we officially kick off, I want to thank you for your involvement in the New York Wine and Grape Foundation this year. We're looking forward to new and exciting initiatives and benefits for our consumer members. We plan on continuing to build our educational programming both online and in person. Stay tuned for more webinars events. If you have any requests for a specific topic, please email me or call me. I will put my information in the chat toolbar so that you have it. And now back to the business at hand today, a few housekeeping notes and reminders. Um, please feel free to use the Q&A bar feature at the it's, it's, if you scroll your hand over the screen, you should see a Q&A and a chat bar toolbar pop up. So if you have a question, please use the, the Q&A bar. And if you have just comments or uh, commentary, please, hopefully you'll be sharing with me all throughout your comments on the lines and if you have any questions. Um, I, in the email I sent you, I included a tasting sheet if you'd like to use with notes, um, but you don't have to, it's up to you. I will send a link to the recording um, of this webinar to you uh, in about 24 hours. All right, so let's get into tasting these wines. Um, sparkling wines can be made in many different styles. It, they're made in all over the world, all different regions, and from many different types of grapes. So lots of talking points. Today we're trying three sparkling wines from three different regions across New York State. We have Lenora Wine Cellars 2013 Brut. We have Johnson Estates 2013 Sparkling Trimonet. And we have the Lens Wineries 2013 Cuvée. All right, and they are actually all made in the traditional method, but we will talk a little bit about the different types of production methods if anybody is curious to know on how you can make sparkling wines. There's actually um, three to four mainstream ways that sparkling wines are made, but the traditional method is the way that champagne is made. And champagne is a region, so we only call sparkling wines made from champagne, France, champagne, everywhere else in the world. They're, you know, sparkling wines is the overarching umbrella of which champagne is one. Germany calls it sect. Uh, in Italy, it can be Prosecco, Francia Corta, uh, or Asti. In most other parts of France, it's called Cremant. Um, in most New World regions, it's called sparkling wine. So it can still be made in the same traditional method that the Champagne region uses, but it's Champagne when it's made in Champagne, France. Little pet peeve of mine, sorry. Uh, back to our tasting at hand. So our first wine is going to be the Glenora Brut. And this wine is made from 76% Pinot Noir, 24% Chardonnay. Now, if you, if you see in front of me, you'll see I have two different shapes glasses. I'm not sure what you're using today. Feel free to share. It's been traditionally, um, sparkling wine traditionally has been poured into a flute, which is a taller, thinner glassware. Um, it's fancy, you know, sparkling wines have long been to, uh, esteemed as the wine of celebration, though I encourage you to drink sparkling wines for all different days and times of the year. It does not need to be saved for a special occasion and it's very food friendly. Um, but the point of this glass functionally was that the tall or thinner shape would transcend the bubbles right up into your nose. Certain theories um, and studies have now proven that it's maybe even better to still appreciate your sparkling wine in a normal wine glass. So to test the theory today, uh, I'm gonna pour them in both. And if you have both, feel free to try it out at home. If you have a preference over flute or regular, choose now and, and stick with it. So back to our wine appreciation steps, if you have the tasting sheet, it's see, smell, sip, and savor. All right, and hopefully you all have your tasting sheet in front of you as well, or something to take notes on. But again, just general categories for taking notes. So 
when we're talking about looking at a wine, and if you joined us for uh, the session on rosés that we did last month, I talked about um, the color changing as wines get older between what white, red, and pink wines. We talked about how different grapes themselves have different colored skin pigments and that affects the color. So there's many things that affect the color of a wine. Generally sparkling wines are very light in color, almost clear, almost like water. Um, so we can take a look at that. Certainly they do still change as they age. Um, and we have wines that are all, you know, they're all 2013 vintage, so they are all uh, six years old. So we, we should see a slightly golden hue to that. But something you should be looking at in sparkling wines in particular are the, anybody want to guess? Feel free to comment in your chat toolbar section. The bubbles is definitely something we should be looking at. All right, so um, of course, when you first pour, you'll see one of the, the bubbles can serve sometimes as an indicator to what type of production method they went underwent. So traditional method bubbles generally are teeny fast effervescent bubbles. So hopefully you're, you're seeing that in your glass right now. All right, so clear, almost, no, not clear. Uh, I would say, again, make sure that you're looking at to best appreciate your wine, make sure you're comparing it to a white backdrop. Use your tasting sheet if you have it in front of you or something else white. So I would say that this is a pale straw color and tiny, tiny fast bubbles. Anything else you wanna talk about in the sight of your glass? Okay, now we'll go on to smelling. And remember, smelling is about 85 to 90% of what you taste in your glass of wine. So it is very important to smell your wine. I have to always swirl my wine, even though in theory in the flute shaped glass, it's bringing it right up to your nose and you can smell it. I just have a tendency to always want to swirl my, my glass. So take a couple of in, deep inhales. Remember we get all sorts of different smells. Generally, uh, you get fruits, maybe some floral, maybe some earth related aromas. So if you want again in your chat toolbar, comment on what you're smelling. With a lot of sparkling wines made in the traditional method, I get a lot of apple notes, a lot of crisp, fresh apple. And then you usually, because the traditional method process is the wine undergoing a second fermentation in the bottle and they trap all those bubbles. So again, geek out moment, the basic alcoholic fermentation equation, if you forgot it from last time, is sugar from the grapes plus yeast equals alcohol, alcohol your glass of wine, plus carbon dioxide and heat are byproducts. So in the traditional method of sparkling wine, those bubbles, that CO2, instead of being released into the air, is trapped in the bottle. And because of all that yeast contact, and generally, um, it remains on for several months, depending on the country you're in, it's regulated how many months, um, 15 months in Champagne, nine months in Spain, US it's not regulated, but still, again, if, if a winery is choosing to do it in the traditional method, they do tend to follow those you know, lengths of pattern. So these bubbles have been trapped in there with the, the yeast still converting, the yeast just kind of settles into the bottom of the bottle. Um, and you get often in the aroma because of that, a very either toast, like bread toast or bread doughy aroma. And especially in sparkling wines that have age, I often get it, some baking spices too, and it reminds me of like baked apple pie in a glass, basically. Um, we also get some, I get a little bit of however you want to define um, kind of the earth smell in a white wine. Generally, that's like a wet rock smell or limestone. Some citrus going on, maybe a hint of lemon there. Maybe a hint of floral, a hint of baking spices. I don't know if anybody's getting that. Again, you don't have to be a flower expert. Uh, maybe if you can just comment if you think they're yellow, white, red or purple flowers, I would go white here, just a touch. Almost, almost like even a cherry blossom or a, on a tree. 
All right, so if no other comments on aromas, go ahead and take your first sip. So think about what you're tasting, and then also think about the structural elements in wine. So the structural elements, in case you've forgotten, are acidity. Acidity is like biting into a lemon. Your jaw tenses, your mouth waters. If you pull your chin in, you have the propensity to drool. That's acidity. Rieslings and Sauvignon Blancs are typically high acid wines. Sparkling wines in general are generally high acid, and I definitely got high acidity in this wine. Mouth watering, crisp, refreshing. Um, another structural element is tannins, which are found in the skid seeds, stems, and oak barrels of a wine. Generally, we don't discuss tannins, but generally they're not found in sparkling wines, are very minimal. Um, sweetness, or the absence of sweetness, which would be dry. So this was called brew, which, just to be fun, sparkling wines have a whole completely different category of um, a scale of dryness for wine. So instead of um, dry being dry, brute means dry in the sparkling world. Um, but it technically can have up to 1.5% residual sugar to still be called brute. So because sparkling wines have such high acidity, they usually are balanced with anywhere from uh, really dry, no residual sugar, up to 1.5%. And they usually are somewhere around that 1% threshold, again, to balance acidity. And in, in this particular case, this one is 1.2% residual sugar, which would be just on the border of off-dry in our normal table wine category. Um, so that's that structural element. And then um, we can talk about the body. Generally, sparkling body, sparkling wines are pretty light in body. Um, and one of the factors that makes up body is the alcohol content. And so last time I told you one way to kind of assess alcohol levels are if you feel a warming sensation, no warming sensation, or maybe a little bit in your nose, they're generally under 10%. If you maybe feel it in your throat area, 10 to 12, 12, 5%. And then if you feel a real warming sensation in your chest, it's usually above 12, 5. Uh, I don't know if anybody was feeling that at all or paying attention. If you need to take another sip to assess, go for it. Um, does anybody want to guess what the alcohol is? I see I have a question. So while you're taking another sip, let me see the question we have. Or is a comment, white flowers. So, okay, good. We were on the same page with the aroma. Apple, I think apple, citrus, doughy, bread dough, fresh dough out of the oven, and some white flowers, really nice. So we have high acidity, we're not talking about tannins. It's brut, which would mean dry in the sparkling world, but does have that touch of residual sugar, that 1.2%. Light body. And any, I didn't see anybody pop up with the alcohol content, but it is 12%. Okay, so that would, maybe you felt a little bit in your throat. How did it, what did everybody think of this sparkling wine? Did you like it? Make sure you make notes. Okay. Any other thoughts or comments on the Glenora Brut 2013? Again, 76 Pinot Noir, 24% Chardonnay. Is anybody wondering how Pinot Noir, which is generally a red wine, is white in this glass, 76%? No thoughts? Well, the next one we're gonna do, I'm actually gonna switch up the order on our tasting sheet a little bit. The next one we're gonna do is the Lens Wineries Cuvée, and that's actually 100% Pinot Noir. So again, a typical red wine made into a white wine. How is that possible? Ah, I see, you're very smart. Somebody commented no skins. So red wines generally get their color from the pigment on the skin, but the the difference between wine making steps between white and red wine is that whites are picked and they're crushed and pressed off the skins immediately, therefore garnering clear juice. Red wines generally ferment on the skins and then get pressed off the skins, so they have all this time to 
um, get the color extract from the skins. However, if we treat red, well, they're technically black or blue grapes generally, like white wine, and we press the skins off immediately, the inside is clear juice. And so, therefore, you can take dark skin grapes that traditionally make red wine and make them into a white wine. However, you cannot make clear or generally grapes that make white wine into red wine because they don't have the color pigment. So you can make them the same way you make red wine and ferment on the skin if you wanted to. Sometimes, sometimes winemakers choose to do that um, for, to add some phenolic character, but it's not gonna change the color. I digress, back to tasting. And I don't know if anybody wanted to do the comparison between pouring, maybe you need to add a little bit more to give it a fair comparison, but in the true nature of assessing between the flute shaped glass and the regular shaped glass, Does anybody have an opinion on what they can smell more out of? Let's see. Make sure. I'm just keeping up with everybody's comments and questions here. I actually think I smell a little bit more than the big glass. Um, and if you're trying it at home, hopefully you're seeing the same thing. It, the main thing that it affects between the glassware is the smell, the ability it's for you to get aromatics. It shouldn't affect the taste. <laughs> Agreed. It smells better in the uh, normal wine glass that we use for table wine, but it always looks pretty. <laughs> in our flute class, because that's what traditionally is used, and it's a beautiful shaped class. All right, let's go on to the lens. Cuvée. All right, and as I said, this is made from 100% Pinot Noir. So again, the first step of wine appreciation is to look at our wine. Look at those bubbles racing up. So again, we have lots of teeny little effervescent bubbles. I'd say this one has slightly more color, not much. They're both, I would say, in the, the straw colored family, but a little bit more golden hue to this wine. Any other? Any other comments on the site of this this wine? Look at them racing up. So now go ahead and take a whoo, take a nice inhale or a couple of them. And remember, if you can smell from far away, that's the intensity of a wine. Some aromas are more intense, or if you have to really stick your nose in, they may be less intense. Maybe it helps you to close your eyes and focus. Maybe you want to try it in the other glass. I'm gonna. Do both again. So what do you smell in this wine? This one, I, in the forefront, hands down, get like baked apple. And I get a little bit of lime. I get a little, like, if, if I was gonna have a hint of flora, it would be like, cherry blossoms. I get a little baking spices. This glass, especially what I was talking about before, and I, I promise I did not try these ahead of time. When I was talking about baked apple pie in a glass, this glass is exactly that for me. In terms of the smell, you get that like, um, just doughy, high crust smell, you get those baked apples, baking spices. Anybody else have anything else that they wanna add? Lemon and orange blossom, yeah, definitely lots of citrus in there. A citrus hint of floral, I like that.
All right, go ahead and take a sip. Maybe you didn't wait for me to take a sip because it smells really good. Feel those teeny effervescent bubbles all over your mouth. Feel, yeah, mouth watering, jaw tensing. This is definitely high acid. As I said, most sparkling wines are, but hopefully you're getting that crisp, refreshing cleansing. We said we smelled a lot of citrus in the nose and you can just feel that citrus cleansing your mouth and the tiny bubbles, we call those scrubbing bubbles, sometimes scrubbing bubbles, they just um, totally refresh your mouth. And that's why sparkling wines are often served as an aperitif or an aperitif as a before, um, a beverage before dinner to get you stimulated and, and craving more food. And I, I don't know if you can feel that going on right now, but I'm definitely salivating and exciting and just totally could go into the next bite of food. But also the scrubbing bubbles help to like cleanse your palate, wipe clean and refresh so that you're, if you're in the middle of eating a bite, sparkling wines help to like cleanse your palate. And so sometimes at restaurants, sparkling wines will be served actually in between courses if you're having a multiple course dinner. Um, they're just really food friendly in general. They are lighter in body, so generally they're served with appetizers or light body food like seafood, um, but they're definitely very food friendly. Okay, sorry, I digress. Back to, back to tasting. What did you taste in that glass? I said high acidity. We're not gonna talk about tannins. Where do you think the RS level is on this wine? And this was also, it says method traditional on it, um, is also the traditional method too. So again, the, the, in, in the traditional method, wines are made like normal table wines, and then the winemaker adds what's called, uh, it, it, they add a mix of um, sugar and yeast into the wine, and put a cap on the bottle and a second fermentation happens and it goes on and on in the bottle for however many months they want or depending on the country it's regulated but that gives it the doughy toasty yeasty notes as well as um, the normal fruit floral earth character that we might get in a normal white wine at after they've um, while it's fermenting again we do something called riddling um, I don't know if you've ever seen, um, it looks like um, a triangle shape, um, <laughs> a triangle shape uh, with a bunch of holes and the bottles actually go, um, they start kind of horizontal and then they go more vertical and it's a um, the Riddler's job in Puba Tree to turn the bottle in traditional times, they would do it a quarter a turn and um, multiple times throughout the day. And that would allow the yeast as it decomposes to settle towards the neck. And then traditionally they would flash freeze the neck, open it up, all of the yeast would come out, they would put a little dosage in it, top it off with whatever sweetness level they desired with a little bit of wine that had a sweetness to it and top them off and then bottle it with that cork wire cage. I'm sure you notice whenever you pick up a bottle of sparkling wine that they're generally thicker, heavier glass and that's to withstand all the pressure in the bubbles. And that's why they're capped with a stronger cork with a capsule over it um, to make sure that it withholds all the bubbles. Uh, so let me just make high acid. So this would be in the brute category as well. It's considered brute. There is just a touch of that residual sugar. And it doesn't say on the bottle or in the tasting notes exactly what it was. I would guess that this is somewhere between probably around 0.6, 0 0.8% residual sugar.
Anybody feel the alcohol? Want to guess what it is? If you already looked at the bottle, you might have ruined the guess. Let's see, Let's see the comments. And um, the alcohol content is, I guess, 12%. Good job. So the same one. And generally, most sparkling wines are often in that 12, 12.5% range. They're generally made in most traditionally cool climates because, again, they're high acid wines and grapes grown in cooler climates tend to produce high acid in the conditions for them. Um, Champagne is one of the most northerly regions in the world. Um, New York State is up there in northerly regions for sure. Um, again, it can be made anywhere in any region, but typically the alcohol percentages are somewhere between 11.5 and 12.5%. What did you think of this wine? Make sure you take your notes. Anybody want to make the comments on what they think, how they liked it? Don't forget to do your comparison here. While we're assessing this in the different glass too, I wanted to make sure we made a note on proper service of sparkling wines. So uh, temperature wise, sparkling wines are generally the, the coldest you'd want any of your wines to be, generally like right out of the fridge temperature, that 40 to 44 degrees Fahrenheit temperature. Most fridges are typically set around 40, 41 degrees. Definitely a little bit more of the aroma in the big, bigger glass and swirl again helps release all the aromatic tree into your nose. Taste I think is pretty similar as we thought in the first one, but definitely a little bit or aromatic in the, in the bigger opening glass, wider rim. All right, any last thoughts, comments on the Lens Wineries 2013? See, good guesses on the alcohol content. Good job. You're always better than you think at guessing the alcohol content. And the more and more you taste, the more and more practice, the better you'll become. I know it's a hard assignment to, you know, practice tasting and appreciating wines, but it definitely practice makes perfect in wine appreciation. So another comment about the wine being really well balanced, definitely it's a really beautiful example. Both were beautiful examples of sparkling wines made in the traditional method. Um, before we get on to the third wine, all three that I picked today were 2013 vintages, which is actually somewhat of, not rare, but often um, sparkling wines are non-vintage or they won't have a vintage date on them and that's because traditionally especially in the region of champagne they are a continue a constant continuous blend of multiple vintages and so that's why there isn't a vintage date in some countries they will deem the growing conditions to have been exceptional for making sparkling wines and then they'll have a vintage or they might save a special pressing or small lot of a vintage year and then you get a vintage. Generally, vintage sparkling wines are a little bit more expensive um, than their non-vintage counterparts. But um, certainly you can find examples of vintages and so the growing conditions throughout the geography of New York State are very different in each of the regions. Um, so it's not a complete fair comparison, but these were all 2013 vintages. And that's the difference between a non-vintage and a vintage. One of the differences is the, year, the grapes, the, the majority of grapes in each of these bottles came from the 2013 vintage. All right, on to our third and final sparkling. We have Johnson Estate. This is also made in the traditional method, Feelings Creek um, Triminette Sparkling. So does anybody know anything about Triminette? That's the grape. It's 100% Triminette. Has anybody ever heard of Tremina or tried it as a table wine before? So in Champagne, France, generally the grapes used to make sparkling wine are Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. 
and in around the world um, a lot of growers and producers will still choose to use those grape varieties but in the new world they can use in most countries in the new world us being one in new york state anyway you can use whatever grapes you want and uh there's often a lot of great sparkling riesling as we grow a lot of riesling in the state um there's all sorts of examples with lots of different unique hybrids you see rosé sparkling um but trimonet maybe you haven't seen as much it is a hybrid let's see what comments came up uh, so somebody guessed it's a Gewürztraminer hybrid. That is correct. So a hybrid is a cross between two different grape species. We have a lot of them in New York State. They're often more cold hardy. They're often more disease resistant. And Triminet is the child of Gewürztraminer. Uh, so if you've had Gewürztraminer before, you know it's very aromatic, especially very floral. So Triminet seems to have a lot of those characteristics as well. Often it has more acidity than Gewürztraminer, um, and, it, and it definitely in general grows better it seems to grow a little bit better in a cooler climate so uh while i was talking i don't know when you poured your glass if you noticed the um bubbles in this glass lots of bubbles uh and they're quick and small again so we see that carry through uh what do you think the color is of this glass Anybody have any comments? It's a, it is a little bit more golden than the other ones. So a little bit more color. And that could be because it's a different grapes used, right? So Trimonet versus Pinot Noir versus Pinot Noir and Chard blend that we had. It could be that they maybe gave it a little bit of skin contact. It could be ju just that Trimonet as it gets older, maybe gets golden more quickly than the other two grape varieties. So lots of Lots of variables there, but all right. So now let's smell this wine. What do you get in the aroma of this wine? If you have any of your previous wines, you can go back and compare too. It's always fun when you're doing a tasting to go back and compare to others. So you can see the similarities and the differences. I get a lot of floral character. And again, I'm not a floral expert, but uh, I, would, I would say this smells pretty reminiscent of roses. And if you've ever had it before, uh, lychee, it's a, an Asian fruit. Definitely those characteristics are very reminiscent of Gewürztraminer. Maybe a little bit of passion fruit, some tropical fruit, more tropical fruit than the other two. I get more tropical fruit than I do apple or citrus. Ginger, yes. Lots of ginger and rose. It's a little bit of, a little bit of apple too, yeah. Ginger is definitely a characteristic of Gewürztraminer. Gewürz actually means like spicy region translated and by spicy, it's, they mean baking spices. Ginger being the most characteristic. Good call on the ginger. And so that yeasty characteristic is, um, to me, a little more toasty in this one than, than fresh bread dough. I'm just reading all your comments as I'm trying to smell. <laughs> All right, let's take a sip and try it. What do you think of all those structural elements? Feel free to take another sip if you need to. What do you think about the acidity level in this wine?
Again, we're not going to talk about tannins. The acidity level is still pretty high. It might not seem as high, and I would say maybe it's more like medium, medium plus versus high. Um, like the other two, it's not as high as the first two we tasted. Um, but there's also a little bit more residual sugar here. So I think um, the residual sugar is more around 3%, which is why I switched the order and we tasted them, because then I looked up the technical data and um, found all the RSs. You always want to taste your wines from as dry to sweet as possible, as you know. Um, and so I should have started with the Lens Winery now that we've tasted them, but I, as I said, didn't know exactly what that was. And I think that and the Glenora were pretty similar um, within a half percent, but this one is a little bit more. So in normal table wine, you know, in the scale of dry, off dry, medium sweet to sweet, this is in that um, between medium dry, medium sweet category. But again, the scale of sparkling wines is different. It goes from, actually goes brut, or brut nature means like 0% residual sugar. Then brut again goes up to 1.5. And then they have dry, actually doesn't mean dry in the sparkling world. <laughs> it means off dry. Um, and then if you like sweet sparkling wines, you want to look for one that's labeled D-E-U-X. That's the sweet category of sparkling wines, okay? And I digress for the mouthful of time today. So what do we taste in this wine? Again, we said the acids, um, medium, medium plus. We had our residual sugar. We're not talking about tannins. What's the body like in this wine? And I'm just doing a, the aroma change here. Definitely those baking spices really shine through, that ginger, that toastiness, and the more tropical fruits. Yeah, definitely not as much acidity, and the acidity seems even lower, respectively, because it has that residual sugar. Somebody commented that the sugar gives the perception of weight, right? So this one does seem like it's more um, a little bit more body than the other two. Excellent job. You guys are all pros at this. And the alcohol content, does anybody want to guess what it is? I'm not sure. Oh, if you didn't look ahead. Hopefully you're feeling it in the similar area. This one is also 12% alcohol. Think about, finish your tasting notes with any final reflections you have, any other comments or questions. I did say I would talk a little bit about the different production types of sparkling wine. So these were all the traditional method, which I have briefly explained. We could spend our, you know, certainly um, top deck it was a whole topic in uh, content for classes at universities. So we spent a lot of time talking about production methods, but in a nutshell, the traditional method takes a lot longer. There's a second fermentation in the bottle and that stays in that bottle the whole time. And it, it produces characteristics of doughy, yeasty breadiness. Um, whereas in some of the other methods, you might not get that as much because they don't have the contact with the yeast. So the transfer method starts out similarly to the traditional method, but then ultimately the wines go into a, a tank and get bottled in another bottle. Um, there is something called the tank method or the Charmat method, and that's where the whole process is done in a pressurized tank to create the bubbles. So generally in tank method wines, which um, Asti is a famous region that uses the tank method, the, the bubbles you'd notice are generally a little bit bigger, maybe not as fast. And then the aromatics of those wines are generally more fruit forward and fruit centered because again, they don't have the, the, the contact with the yeast in the second fermentation. So that's one of the key differences. Um, it's also a faster process. So generally 
the price of, of sparkling wines made in the tank method are less expensive compared to the traditional method. Um, there is also something called forced carbonation, which is kind of similar to the way, you know, uh, lots of non-alcoholic beverages that are carbonated get their bubbles and, and, you know, as it sounds, they force carbon dioxide into the, to the wines. And, and again, um, different mouthfeel a little bit, different size bubbles and re-up bubbles. Um, and those wines you might even see in screw caps. A lot of them are now in screw caps versus the traditional method. And, and so um, those are some differences. And those are pretty much the four production methods for making sparkling wines in a very fast nutshell. <laughs> Any questions on that? You know, we could certainly spend more time discussing each of them. We talked about glassware, we talked about proper temperature with sparkling wines, vintage, ver vintage versus non-vintage sparkling wines. Um, as I said, depending on the region, different grapes are used, though the tr three traditional grapes used in sparkling wine are often Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, and Pinot Meunier. Pinot Noir and Pinot Meunier are dark skin grapes that are pressed off their skins to produce generally white wines, but there is such a thing as Blanc de Noir, which means white of black in French. And so um, that means generally that they're made just from those black skin grapes versus a Blanc de Blanc means white of whites and is generally made just from Chardonnay. Um, you can find sparkling wines in, in pink color, right? So sometimes they are made more with that skin contact a little bit to get the color. Um, Sparkling wine, even in old world countries, is one of the exceptions where you can actually take a white wine and a red wine and blend them together to make pink uh, for pink sparkling wines. Or they can just have a shorter contact, as we talked about in the rosé class last time. So instead of red wines generally ferment on the skins for usually a couple of weeks, depending on the winemaker and the, the grape variety itself, uh, pink wines generally can range from a couple of hours to a day or two depending on what color pink and other components they're going for in the wine. So same thing with sparkling wines. Any other questions or comments about sparkling wines today? Uh, our next tasting will be on August 25th, Sunday at 4 p.m. And it's going to be Cabernet Francs from three different regions. Um, I might have forgotten as I was introducing the wines, I said the producer of each, but the Glenora sparkling we had today, the Glenora Brut, is from the Finger Lakes region. The Lens Winery is from the Long Island region. And the um, Johnson Estate Terminat was from the Lake Erie region. So again, very different uh, ge geographical climates in each of those regions. Um, so different average temperatures, growing degree days, you know, uh, distance to very differing bodies of water in all three regions. Their proximity to bodies of water makes a big difference and helps them to be able to grow grapes, period. Um, but of course, the Lake Erie region has Lake Erie. Uh, Glenora is on Seneca Lake in the Finger Lakes. And um, the Lens Winery in Long Island has the Atlantic Ocean, which is the biggest moderator. So more of a maritime, a little bit warmer climate for them. Okay. Last chance to ask any questions or add any comments. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope everybody had a lot of fun. Um, bubbles don't last, so make sure you uh, either get a special uh, closure that helps keep the pressure in, or maybe shrink, uh, shrink, drink and share them with others before the bubbles dissipate. Um, as I said, they're often as a celebration and good times, which is so wonderful, but they also are very food friendly. So make sure to try them with lots of different foods and find out which is your best um, pairing. They, they really do go great with a lot of food. And without any further questions, I'll end the session today. As I said, I'll email a copy of the recording to you um, tomorrow at some point. And I love to get your feedback and hear any comments. So if you have any recommendations, please feel free to email me or add them in the chat toolbar. I will put my email address and phone number in there now. And again, thank you so much for joining me today. Have a great day.